morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning, Mr. Sabbath. All right. For this week's lesson, we're in lesson number two, entitled The Fall. So if you'd like to turn with me there in your Bibles, we're going to do it a little different as I usually do. We're not going to really um, study from the lesson. We're just going to read the chapter three of Genesis. So keep your lessons open if there's something there that you want to uh, bring out. Uh, but ultimately, we're just going to be reading from Genesis 3. So like I said, once again, if there's anything you want to bring out from the lesson, something that I'm not bringing out, please do so. Um, um, but we'll stay primarily in, in the scriptures. So Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Before we begin, forgive me for two things. One, I'm going to have candy in my mouth because I have some throat issues because of my allergies. So I need that. Um, the candy I'm having is a, a, a medicine for my throat to help me breathe. And I don't know how many of you have been dealing with allergies the past two weeks. Really, really bad, right? So forgive me for that as we do this morning's message. So how many of you were able to do your lesson? Okay, great, the majority of you. I love Genesis 3, especially in regards to the fall, because what we are going to see through this lesson of this week, there are many things in which many people do not bring up, or there is many things that people believe are, ah, how can I say this? There is a set of teachings in Christianity, or in Adventism, shall I say, that is correct. But there's more to the story than just what we corporately believe about Genesis 3. I'll say that. There's more into the scriptures that we can take out than just the normal, everyday, Eve believed the serpent, or Eve made uh, Adam, or tempt Adam. Just the basic story that we have an understanding. There's more in-depthness that the scriptures give us that I believe that many of us do not see when we read Genesis 3 on the fall. So I'm going to attempt to bring that out this morning to answer a couple of questions. So let us open up with a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this time in which we are about to spend in the scriptures. We thank you for this blessing of this week and the lesson that we have uh, read and to prepare for today. Just bless our hearts, bless our minds, especially Heavenly Father at this time as we open up the scriptures. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, quick question. Who's to blame for sin in this world? Quick answer, the devil. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. Is it biblical? <laughs> yeah. Is it? Are you sure? Uh, it, it happened in heaven before it happened on earth. So sin was already in heaven before they came because he knew conscious. sin and he deceived after that. Okay, so sin was alive and well prior to the creation of this world. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but that's not what my question was. <laughs> <laughs> that's your question. question. Let me state it a different way. You can blame this, God and a woman. <laughs> who is responsible for bringing sin into this world? God. Some do say God. Who else? He put the tree. Are you thinking Some of you already said Satan. Yeah. Are you thinking of you? I don't know. I'm asking you a question. I'm not saying what I'm thinking of or anything. I'm just asking a question. Well, Adam, Adam said it was the woman you gave me, so... Uh, okay. So it all went so back to Christ. Ron's putting the blame on Eve. You said Eve. Who else? If the tree wasn't there. It's God's fault because of the tree? Because he created the serpent? The tree. He allowed sin to come in this world? It was already predestined for, for it to happen. It was a choice of mankind. <clears throat> okay. Okay, what else? Whose fault was it? I'm not going to give you the answer. I just thought it was a good question. <laughs> I'm not. Gonna, I'm going to give you the answer in a little bit as we read scripture, but I'm not going to give you the answer right now. It had to be played out. Because yeah, that's not the question, though. <laughs> yeah, I know, but the, the question is whose the fault is it? <laughs> it was Lucifer's in the beginning. Okay, Randy. In heaven, he started it, so it had to be fought out here on earth. But that's not the part of the question, Randy. The first lie in this world was told right there in Genesis 3. That's when sin entered this world. So the devil is a liar. He's been a liar from the beginning. And he's always going to be a liar. 
And so he's the one that brought sin into the world. He was the first sinner in this world. Okay. Does that sound logical? Well, we'll see certainly. <laughs> like I said, it's just a question. There's no wrong answers. It's just a question. I'm kind of wanting to stir you guys up. The reason why I asked this question to start off with, because I want to get your minds thinking. Okay? I don't want you to just, okay, let's just read, and yes, we know the story. Yes, we know about sin. Yes, we know what played out. And we leave it at that. Is there more to the story? I believe that there is. There's way more to the story. And it would answer a lot of people's questions that have or that people have in regards to why sin came into this world. Um, why if God was so just and great and is God, why would there be suffering in this world? We find all those answers here in Genesis 3. And if we would dive in a little bit deeper, and I believe all of us have to a point, and sometimes like a lot of you, like me, myself, I forget a lot of things. You know, sometimes I have to restudy to contemplate uh, certain aspects of the gospel. If we have these answers and this understanding, we can better explain to people other than, well, the devil did it. Because to me, I'm sorry, it's a cop-out for someone to say, well, the reason why I sinned is because the devil made me do it. Because that would imply what? Yeah, well, that's what power could reach your mind. You have no personal responsibility in the matter. You have no choice. Or to, eat, to even say, I'm doing this because God told me to, implies what? You have no freedom of choice. You're always only doing what you're told to do. And in that regard, that's not Christianity. That's not faith. Because God doesn't say you do this or else. He says you'll do this for a better life. If you love me like I love you, you'll do this because I did this above and beyond even what I'm asking you to do. Right? It's a relationship aspect. It's a cop-out to say, Satan's fault. He, didn't, he made me do it. Or it's his demon's fault. They made me do it. Or I'm just doing this because God says I have to. Or it's written here, that's why I'm just doing it. How many of you who are in a relationship, a married couple, would like to live the rest of your married life by saying, I only do this because my wife or my husband tells me to do it? <laughs> Is your relationship going to last? Why won't it last? Most relations are like that. I've been yeah. studying women. Yeah. Women are the bosses, yeah. and the men just. The, yeah. Yeah. Regardless that's why. Of who, that's why you have some. Regardless of who's in charge and who's not, that's not the point. Okay, because if you're in that type of relationship, it's never going to last. And if it does last for a long period of time, it's miserable. Because one person isn't allowed to be themselves. That's the they story. always have to be what the other expects them to That's be. That's where we're at today, though. Exactly, right? That's why we have so much downfall in marriages and relationships. Women want to be the bosses of everything, tell you what to do. <laughs> okay, so yeah. that's as far as we're going to go into the marriage aspect of, of, this, <laughs> of, of this study, right? Maybe later on we'll come back to it when it comes to the cursing <laughs> of the ground and the relationships of man and woman, right? Which is Thursday's lesson. Maybe we'll come back to the, the marriage aspect. Hopefully we won't get to that. Um, but let's start in verse 1 of chapter 3, okay? Verse 1 of chapter 3. It's interesting in this story, and I'm just going to read up to, let me see, I'm going to read up to verse 7, and then we'll backtrack, and we'll break down and explain, okay? So we'll just read the verses, the, story, the first part of the story for this week's lesson, and then we'll backtrack and break down. Genesis 3 verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat. 
and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them were both open, excuse me, of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, before we do the breakdown in this story, most people don't have the understanding is what we see here in Genesis 3 is exactly the same issues that we find in the Gospels when Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness. Uh, it's the same exact uh, concepts that are happening. It's the same attacks in which Satan attacked Eve here. She attacked Jesus in the wilderness. And we know that biblically there are three aspects in which the Satan uses in order to tempt each and every one of us. Now, if you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 John 2.16... We learn what these three aspects are that Satan uses to tempt all of humanity. Now, we always talk about how all of the rules and laws in the world can be uh, broken down into ten, right? Basically, the Ten Commandments. Well, all the ways and aspects of sin in this world, the way people are tempted by Satan and his angels, can be broken down into three aspects. And this is what we find in 1 John 2, 16. It says, For all that is in the world... The lust of the, of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of what? The world. the world. So what are the three aspects of the ways that Satan can tempt people in? The seeing of the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life. I want you to keep those concepts in your mind as we read Genesis 3. Because what we are going to find here, as John talks about the three aspects of the way Satan uh, gets people to sin, the avenues in which he tempts, the lust of the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life, is the exact same three concepts that he tried to get Jesus to be tempted in the wilderness. But on the other hand, it's exactly what Satan used to tempt Eve in Genesis 3. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those three concepts himself, Eve failed in every department. Those are the three things that Satan used to tempt Eve and get her to change and switch to God. Yes? Do you think he would have been able to tempt Adam first? Well, it didn't happen, so we don't know. But if you want to say another way, we know that Adam still continued living hundreds he took of years, it. right? Adam chose the, the flesh. I know, and I was going to say, he still sinned one way or another, yeah, right? But, Just like the he, rest of us. But he been able to bend the first one, though. He wasn't, so we, there's no reason to contemplate that because we don't know the answer. It's a thought. It wasn't, it's a thought, but it's one we can't say is true because it didn't happen. But she presented, it was evil. She presented it just to him, him, she presented to Adam what happened to her. A portion of it. Yeah, and he, he agreed, so. But he agreed on a different premise rather than what the, what the serpent was selling Eve. Mm -hmm. What was a sales pitch? The other one was just lust. <laughs> wow. we'll, we'll read. We'll read. Think, see, think upon those things as we read. And the reason why I do it this way is because I, I want you guys to study the Bible like I study it. I don't just read it, right? I ask myself questions all the time. What if this? Like, like what, if, what if that happened? Or why is it saying it in this manner? Or why is it repeating it in this way? Or what does this word mean? Or how does this pertain to this other story in the Bible? When you constantly ask yourself those questions and many more, you start getting different things out of the Bible that are not there literally. Right? You understand what I mean by that? There are some things that anybody can understand in the Bible just by reading it. Right? But then there are other things people who are not connected to God can't understand because the Bible says about spiritual discernment. Right? The Holy Spirit will teach you things that are not plainly written with words in Scripture. And this is what I believe happens in Genesis 3. And it happens everywhere, but for our lesson's sake here in Genesis 3. Now let's talk about the serpent. Who or what was the serpent? <clears throat> yes? Can we not talk about that yet? <laughs> well, it's well, verse we, 1. <laughs> we, we, we need to go back to what happened prior to in heaven, we don't know how long it took for Lucifer to create an actual war in heaven. He didn't do. He didn't get 
up and say, you know, God is unfair and all this kind of stuff and, and create a great commotion. No. He just told a little white lie. He would insert a little thought into somebody's head and then just walk away and let them think about it. No, I understand so that. It might have taken a million years. We don't know. But the fact is that he didn't do it. This, this, what we're talking about in Genesis 3 is an off-the-charts deception. Yeah, but our, uh, the context, we need to stay in context of our study. Our context well, is not the war in heaven. Our context is what happened in Eden. But so, I'm, I'm trying to get there. No, I know that, but there's, a, there's, I only have so much time. And the context of the story of our lesson is what happened in Eden, not prior. And we have that lesson another time. Okay, right? can I just finish what I want to say here? Yes, please. But okay. Let's not explain the whole story for time's sake <laughs> because that's not, our, that's not our study for the week. Okay. But what the devil did with Eve is this. He didn't just have a little conversation with her. When she looked at that... Hold on, Randy. Hold on, let me stop you. If you're going to explain the story, let's not do that. Because that's why we're going to read the story. I'm just going to explain an aspect of the story. Okay, but if we're not I, there yet. If I can do that. No, not yet, because we're not there yet. When we get to your aspect of the story, then explain that story. But we're not there yet. Okay, so okay. if you're going to tell me what well, Satan did to Eve, you can't tell me because we haven't read it yet and broken it down. Let's take it verse by verse by verse, and when we hit on the verse that you want to explain, okay, go for you, it. You tell me what I can go. You, well, I don't know what your thought is. I don't know what your thought is. So that's why you have to raise your hand. Okay. So when we get to that portion where you want to explain your your what you're just about to say, raise your hand. Okay. All right. Verse one. What is the serpent? Because we are introduced to this creature known as a serpent. What is it? For those of you who already have read verse one, because we already read it, what is the serpent? Flying flying okay, where does it say in verse 1 it's a flying reptile? We know it says. Where does it say in verse 1? <laughs> I'm asking you to add, well, okay. Let's answer questions in regards to what the scripture says, not into our other knowledge in regards to what Sister White says. Not saying that that's wrong. I believe all that. Context. Remember, I said earlier. These portions of scripture have the answers that you need to give to other people to help them understand the Bible. Are you going to have answers to people's questions that are barely, barely learning about the Bible based off of spirit of prophecy or based off the Bible? Bible. Bible. So why are you giving me spirit of prophecy answers? <laughs> okay, I understand why you are, right? But let's stick to the Bible. Right? What is the serpent? It's a representation of Satan. I mean, he came in the form of a serpent. Okay. What else? More cunning than any beast. More cunning than any beast? So. Okay. What else? Remember, this verse one, context. Can he talk in first one? Okay. Great. What else? Okay. The devil. Okay. What else? What else? The devil. He's the devil. Okay. What else? Fallen angel. Okay. Now does it say that he's the devil, fallen angel in verse one? No. no. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Yes. Let's explain out of verse one. Lord. Let's look. Let's look. Okay. Let's look. It says the serpent. So there's a creature that's here in the garden, right? Named the serpent, and it gives us some characteristics about the serpent. Now. I will give you um, advisory. I may ask you questions in this study that will flip your understanding of everything you've already been told. But I'm not doing that to tell you you're wrong. I'm doing to make you think. And the questions I may ask you are not to tell you this is what the answer is. They're to make you think. Because when we read scriptures, we should think. We should ask God questions. Ask the Holy Spirit, what does this mean? Why does it say it this way? So that way we can understand. So remember that. 
So we know that there's a, serp a serpent. And then the Bible begins to give us characteristics of, about the serpent. Right? The Bible says that the serpent was subtle. Now when you read in your concordance, it talks about the craftiest, cunning, smart. Right? So this serpent that was made is probably the most intelligent creature that was ever made next to man. Okay? Because it also says, of any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So there was two creations, and I'm going to lump everyone into one and the other. There was mankind and animal kind, right? And animal kind includes the creepy crawling creatures, all that stuff. I'm dumping everything into those two. The serpent was made into the animal kind. But apparently, it was smarter and craftier, cunnier, more beautiful than any other creature that God had made. Now, in the animal kingdom, are there different different levels of intelligences that animals have? Yes. yes. There is, right? Some are pure animals, while others can be trained. I, I remember hearing about this one guy up north, I think it was in Mora, where he, he trained his pig to be like a dog. And the dog, the pig would bark all the time and act like a dog. That's possible, right? My aunt, she had a cat. And I believe because my other aunt that lived with her yelled so much and always yelled my other aunt's name because my aunt is deaf, she can't hear, that the cat all of a sudden began to, whenever it would meow, it would meow. It would say my aunt's name. Witness? Did you ever hear it? Yeah? I've heard it on TV. Yeah, it on TV. You see it on TV? So they can be trained, right? Birds. Bird, well, birds, yeah, right? But there are other animals that have that vocal or, or intelligence to where they can do it easier than others, right? Other animals can be trained while some can. But this serpent was the best that God had made in the animal kingdom. The very, very best. So it says here... That out of the best, it says that he began to speak. And he said unto one of the women, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Let me ask you a question. And I'm not saying that this is reality. But if the serpent was the best that God made out of the animal kingdom, is it possible that it's the only animal creature that God made to speak. The donkey. <laughs> Remember, I told you, I'm going to pose questions to you, not saying are true, but they're, they're just to get you think. Let me give you an understanding of how my mind works. I pose this question to you, could it be that the serpent spoke? I don't believe the serpent had the physical capability to speak. Mm -mm. I don't believe that. I believe it was Satan speaking through the serpent. That's what I thought. Which there are many examples in scripture to prove that point. But when I go into it in my question form, I ask myself, does a serpent have the capability physically to speak? No. You see how asking some of these questions can help you to come to the understanding that a, it's not physically possible for the serpent to speak. So therefore, in order for it to speak to Eve, it had to be what? Possessed. Supernatural. Meaning it's more likely Satan was the one speaking through the serpent rather than the serpent actually being, having the ability to speak. It's called possessed. Right? Yes. So when you ask these questions, although you may say, Ray, I'm a Christian, I already believe that. Guess what? There are people who don't. And there are people who have those types of questions that need those questions answered. And if we're not asking those questions of ourselves to have a biblical answer, how are we going to properly teach them and answer their questions? But there are some of those questions you can answer. Yeah. There are some you just can't. And I think when you come to that point, you have to be honest with the person or person you're talking with. And you say what? We just don't. That is, that is not necessarily that answer there. But... When you look at what you just said, the devil being a serpent, being deceptive, uh, uh, disguising himself, 
you can see him doing that. I think sometime in talking to not only just non-Christians, even people who may be young in the faith, if I can use that expression, may not quite understand that. Like what you were yeah. just saying, we use a lot of spirit of prophecy, but there's some things in scripture, it's just not where you can just put your hand on. Exactly. If that makes sense. Exactly. And this is why I ask myself these questions. Let me ask you another question. This is one of those hard questions that are made to make you think. You said it, Lewis. You said that Satan, uh, this, uh, uh, how did you say it? Disguise. Disguise. Thank you. Thank you. He disguised himself, right? Question. Can Lucifer transform himself into a being or other things that's not him? Yeah. Yes. Give me an example. Speaking, what does the your, uncle, say? your dead uncle come and talk to you, your dead aunt talk to you, or something like that, yeah. in a form of, uh, uh, it's called a, familiar spirit. an illusion, right? Okay, okay. Do you want to take that, the story of Endor? Yeah. Right? Paul Saul's, well, the, it wasn't Samuel, but it kind of says that it was. What did Lucifer transform himself in front of Jesus in the wilderness? An angel. An angel. And into an angel of light. Now here's the question. Not saying this is true. Remember that. I don't want anybody to say that I'm teaching wrong here, right? Is it possible that Satan did not possess a physical serpent, but transformed himself into the physical serpent of likeness in order to deceive Eve? Could have done that too. Serpent. Both ways are possible. Okay, so that is the type of question that will cause issues amongst Christianity, right? It could. It's an argument, though. It is a debate. Although I believe more like Alex, that it was a physical serpent that the devil possessed. The reason why I ask this question is there are people out there who are non-Christians who have asked me this question. And I have to biblically show them that I believe it was physical and he possessed them. But not leaving out that, hey, that's an idea that Satan could transform himself into the serpent because he has that capability. Right? Did the Bible say in a form of a serpent? No, or it doesn't say. See? See, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. It only describes the serpent. And, and that's, what, that's why their question brings up something great. Because in the first verse... What is being told to us about the serpent? Is it being told to us what Spirit of Prophecy says that about its physical traits? What does Spirit of Prophecy say? Now you're able to tell me what Spirit of Prophecy says. What does it say? That it was a golden serpent that flies. And in other points, has a melodious voice as he was speaking to Eve. Does the Bible tell me that? Or does the Bible tell me that there are certain characteristics of attributes of that serpent instead of telling me what the physicalness of it is? Yes. This is why people have that question. You may not have came across that question, but I have. And I have to figure out how to use the Bible to explain that in regards to this context of Scripture. Because it doesn't explain the physical aspect. It explains the characteristics so is it possible that Satan could disguise himself as the literal physical serpent because Eve only saw characteristics, that's what the Bible says, not physical form. I'm not saying she didn't see the serpent flying as gold. What I'm bringing out is what the Bible brings out and just asking questions. Yes, sir. There may be two angles to this. Was it uh, the serpent, Satan, Pursuing Eve, or did Eve get attracted to the serpent? Who, who was who was uh, the first one to initiate? Kind of, there's a question for you. I, I don't know. Great question, and that should be one that we should ask while we're reading the story. How did Eve end up there? Right. It doesn't say. But can we rationalize how she might have gone there? That's why I say there's two aspects to the who is pursuing who. Yeah, I mean it's easy it's easy to go to spirit prophecy and get the answer, right? right? Yeah. But let's get the answer biblically. 
How did she end up there? Does the Bible actually tell us how she got there? Well, all we know is, according to the Bible, as we read the story, is that she was alone. And where was she at? In a place where she was not supposed to be. So apparently, if she's alone in a place where she's not to be, where's Adam? Somewhere else. Right? That's all we can conclude. So at one point in time, while being in the garden, as Ron asked the question, Eve, for some reason, biblically we do not know why, she left Adam's side and began to take a stroll through the garden. And as she took a stroll through the garden, she winds up where? By the tree. In the midst of the garden. <clears throat> right dead center in the middle of the garden. And there was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what caught Eve's attention as she got to this tree? Something began to speak to her from this tree. Was the devil waiting for her then? I, mean, I think so. Kind of waiting like a trap. You go in and you see, hmm, I'm going to go a little further and you like waiting there. Another question. I'll, I'll get to you. Let me, let me answer this. Another good question. Of all everything that was in the garden, was not everything blessed and sin had tainted nothing? Yes, right? The answer is yes. yes. The only place in the garden in which sin can set itself as a foundation was where? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. If Satan, by possessing the serpent, became the form and representation of sin, how did the serpent get from one place to another in the garden? Get to fly. Yeah, you're telling me the right answer, but I want you to think. Okay, hold on, Steve. If the serpent was the epitome of sin and the only place sin could be with was in this tree, that would mean several factors. This is why I want you to ask questions. It could not walk through the garden. Because why? It has wings. Why could it walk through the garden? Because that was the only place that it could be. If Satan in the in the in the in the, in the possessing the serpent the only place that it could dwell upon was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It could not walk through the garden or jump from tree to tree or swing from tree to tree because then it would do what? It would infect the rest of the garden with sin. The serpent, so we can conclude one thing, it did not have legs and arms. The serpent, and it possibly could, but it didn't use them. In this aspect, the serpent, as we know that today, could not crawl through the garden because snakes can crawl from tree to tree, to tree to tree to tree. Correct? I seen it happen. Pythons, right? Tree to tree, but they couldn't do that. Why? For the one aspect we know, the Bible says they did not crawl on their bellies till after sin. What's the only conclusion left of the serpent? The serpent had to be by the tree, and the woman had to be thinking about the tree before the fact. Okay, you, missed, that's the why the <laughs> you missed the point of the question. What's, what can we conclude in regards to the serpent? It, it was flying, right? Well, so when we ask simple questions like that, Ron, and we conclude just based off reasoning, we can show other people more about what spirit prophecy says, because it's reality and it's biblical truth. We just have to ask questions in a new process of elimination, right? So just by that reasoning, using that question, and just a couple thoughts, we can conclude that the serpent was here in the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, in the middle of the serpent, and the way he got there is how? He flew, got there, and was waiting for Eve. That's what I said. I know, but we have to do the contest in order. <laughs> You'd like to say it. You remember, we're studying, and we have to explain it to people. If I get one thing here, one thing here, one thing here, I have to eventually put it together. Wait. It's easier to go step by step by step. The Satan yeah. was always on the tree, and he was just waiting to who came close to the tree. It's possible, right? See, that's the way I was thinking. He's, she's coming closer. She says, oh, I got her. 
It, the Adam didn't come. Eve came. She says, mm, she's thinking about it. Now, right. Spirit Prophecy does say something else that will help you understand why Eve got there at that position. We won't go into that. I'll let you read it for yourself, Patriarchs and Prophets, entitled The Fall. Yes. I just want to say that um, when God made, since we can use a little bit of Spirit of Prophecy, yeah. <laughs> uh, when God made uh, Adam and Eve, He just didn't put them in the garden and just say that was it. They knew right up ahead about Satan. Mm -hmm. They was already informed about his kindness. So they was aware of what was going on. Yeah. However, as we know that the devil, he disguised himself even with us. I mean, we can look up. I'm a drunk and I'm driving before I know it. Ooh, yeah. I'm right there at a liquor store, you know. <laughs> so that's how the devil, or, or he might send a friend, you know, that also do the same things that I do. So as the Bible said, we not this is not flesh and blood that we are fighting with. So the point I'm making that they already knew, and like you were saying about the Christians, like when we have Bible study, but also and I said some things we just don't know. Mm -hmm. And when we all get to heaven, we all gonna be forever learning. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to say, hey, I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> You know, and some things, too, that I tell my kids that some person that you ask, it might not have anything to do with your salvation, mm -hmm. you know. So we just going to have to take the Bible for what it says. I mean, I can dissect it with my little puny mind that I have and all the knowledge that is in this Bible. I cannot. I'm still forever learning. So I just want to just encourage everybody. You know, I don't know how that happened. I don't know what happened, but I, I do know that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. And just like you're saying, you know, they, I believe, it, just like you say and you do, that, you know, Adam and Eve were warned prior about the Satan and, and things that happened in heaven. I believe they were warned. But aren't we all warned about things that we should stay away from and a lot of times we don't listen, we do it anyway. It's the hot stove, hot iron principle, right? Don't touch it, you're gonna burn yourself. We don't know what burning yourself means or the, or the concept of why we shouldn't touch it until when? You burn it. Until we touch it, right? They, they could have known everything possible what happened prior in heaven, but when it came to Eve being near Lucifer, which we'll show here in a little bit, um, she was truly deceived because she knew about the adversary, but the adversary was so cunning in his depiction of himself and his wording, she fell for it. You know, if you were making me think when you talked about the fact that Satan wasn't swinging from tree to tree or, you know, all of that stuff that he was there in the tree, I was just as a life, I look at the Bible and I always try to find that life lesson that's in it. Mm -hmm. He was exactly where the temptation would be for her and I was thinking about how that is with us in our lives. You know, a billboard could turn a man or a woman in a second. You know, Satan knows exactly where our weak points are mm -hmm. and he doesn't have to jump around from tree to tree or go a different route. He can go directly to that temptation and he can cause yeah. I don't know, that's just and that's why we have to be careful of what we watch, what we hear, all those avenues that take into our brain, right? Because it can all be temptation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, verse 2. Now this is where we come to the deception of Eve. And this is what's going to be very interesting. Now, what did I say was the three aspects, the way Satan uh, tempts you to sin? Okay, now it doesn't necessarily happen in that order all the time. Now, as we read what happened with Eve, see if you can find what those three aspects are. It's, it's throughout this whole um, two to six, it happens over and over again. So let's see if you can bring them up. So the serpent begins, oh, the serpent begins to speak to Eve. And what was his first response to her at the end of verse one? 
Hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So the serpent starts off his dialogue by questioning her belief, right? Her belief and faith that God was telling her the truth in chapter 2 about how they should live, how they to pertain to the world, pertain to the garden, that they should eat of that tree, but they could eat of every other tree. He's questioning her faith and her belief in God by saying, is it really true that you can entertain yourself with every tree of the garden except this one? Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now he's implementing his first step into deceiving Eve by having her think, did God not call all of this good? Right? Did not God say, I can eat of all of this? Neglecting the fact that he pointed out one very thing in particular, you shall not eat of. But he's getting her to think of the whole rather than the one thing, right? Verse 2 starts off with the response from the woman. Now, before we read the response, you would think, now we have the, ba the, the concept now of 2020, right? We can think back and say, man, they were really dumb. I would never fall for that. When in reality, what happens? We fall for it. We fall day. for it, right? Every day. <laughs> Just like they do. No difference. But here we have that, we can use that kind of concept to say, Eve, what are you doing? You're here at this place in the midst of the garden, and you're doing whatever you're doing, and all of a sudden you hear a voice and you stop. You hear a question that's answered, and you entertain. You entertain the very thing that that snake or serpent is saying, not realizing, hey, I'm speaking to a snake or a serpent. What would go through your mind at that time? You can use what you know now. That's fine if you want to answer in that way. But if you want to think, if you were Eve at that time, what's going through your mind? Why would she entertain and speak to a serpent? Why would she answer back? Well, maybe she, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Maybe she didn't know that, you know, I mean, because everything was there. Why wouldn't she think that maybe the snake could talk? Right. Yeah. Is, is, did God warn them, hey, there's a serpent that talks in the garden, don't talk to it? Yeah. Or there's animals that talk, don't talk to them when they talk to you? <laughs> right? We don't find that record. Right? The curiosity so, is, if that animal ate of that tree... And don't go that far. Don't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> See? I stopped Louie too. It's not just you guys. <laughs> but that's a, that's a possibility, right? What else is another possibility? Could it be that... And, and I'm just... I'm assuming here. What's but, your question, brother? Yes, please. No, I'm asking, what is your question? Okay. Could it be... That's more of a statement than a question, but could it be that as he was, was crossing towards, crossing the garden, coming towards the knowledge of good and evil, she hears this voice, all of a sudden she's thinking, okay, who was that? It's not Adam, because I left him behind. Who was that? And she's looking around, and then it speaks again. Oh, that's who's speaking to me. But yet Eve, because of being in the garden, so naive because everything's all perfect. She sees this cunning serpent, the best that God ever made, and is bedazzled by the very sight that she sees. She's not aware that, hey, it's really a talking serpent speaking to me. Could it be? Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't appear to. I think in having that conversation, He's most likely at that time doesn't appear to be an enemy of God because he's talking some of the language. You said the very word mm -hmm. appear. And yes, and so right? yes, and so one of the reasons why, and, and I think we all heard the old term uh, teaching your children stranger danger. Mm -hmm. In this case, he's saying some of the same thing that God would have said. So he doesn't appear to be an enemy, not at this particular time. So that makes him a little bit more attractive. Well, it sounds good. That's what I think. And the voice. <laughs> I love the way you're thinking. 
How does Satan come to deceive God's people? I think we have to think, be thinking about the sin that we want. Satan understands us. He studies us real well. Okay, He studies us real well. He knows our habits. He knows what we're fighting up against. And when he, he uses it against us, and you know that little angel who tells you yes and no that we hear about? It's our voices. It's the Holy Spirit and Satan yeah. talking to us, right? So it's a choice we make, the same way. Yeah, yeah. It's we a, have to be looking at that tree already. We have to be thinking about that tree. That's why she was there. I know. Think of the question, though. How does <clears throat> Satan come to each and every one of us to tempt us? Well, you read in John, John, uh, 1 John 2. No, must know the weaknesses. He uses those three senses in a way, right? Mm -hmm. But does he come to us in the form of evil? Or does he come to us in the form of the best that God has? Think upon that. He came to Eve as the greatest creature that God made, right? It was stunning, it was beautiful, all these aspects of characteristics, right? And he used that to his advantage to deceive Eve. How does Satan come to deceive the people in the end of the world to follow him? To be like God. He comes in the aspect in the form of the second coming, mm -hmm. impersonating Christ. In the garden, the wilderness, how did he come to Jesus? As one of his angels. faithful angels. But what gave him away? The words he said, right? Because if he was an angel of God, he should already knew who Jesus was. He would have tempted him. Yeah, he didn't have to make him, um, um, not question, but, um, what's the right word? Jesus didn't have to make himself known to the angel because he should already know. But the questioning that Satan used was, if thou art, right? Wanting to make Jesus show who he was. So here in the in the deception, Satan uses that same form by coming in the form of godliness, if you want to put it. The characteristic of godliness. Right? So therefore, why would Eve think anything was wrong if he came as the best creature that God made? Where's the flags? There shouldn't be any flags yet. Even the speaking is not a flag yet. Because the form has not yet revealed itself that it has evil content. Right? So the flags are not up yet. Yes, Rasha. Oh, I think I was just moving. Okay. <laughs> Steve. But it was already a conscious choice. It was choice, because sin is a choice, you see. You know, we're born with the, the desires until God transforms us, and then it's a battle. You know, we either give it up or we don't. Yes, but we're not there yet. Isn't it you said earlier, she knew God's voice, she knew Adam's voice, but she never heard this voice before. I was so waiting for someone to bring that up. I heard you, and I just was like, come on. But anyway, she never heard this but, voice. But isn't so that she was like, wow, is there somebody else in this garden that he created that I didn't know about? Yeah. <laughs> and so else. therefore may entail when the serpent gave the understanding of that there's something else she could achieve. Well, hello. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? We ask ourselves questions. We understand a little bit more how the deception happened and the things that are playing out. Right? Okay, 
So the woman said to the serpent, so she's seen all these things and now she responds to the serpent. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. What was her response? Yes. So she's acknowledging what he's saying. That yes, God has allowed them to eat of every tree of the garden. But, there's a but. She says in verse 3. This is where I'm going to ask another question. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, Pastor, you just came in here, and I said at the beginning, I want you to understand this as well, there are certain questions that I'm going to ask during this Sabbath school lesson. I'm not saying that it's the right answer. I pose these questions not to change our thinking or our faith, but to help us make us think as we read the Bible. Here's one of those questions. What was Eve's response? We can eat of all the trees of the garden. God has said yes. But then she says what? But. but there's an exception. And this exception has how many rules? Two rules. Right? We cannot eat of this only tree, the very tree that you're doing what? That you're on, you're touching it, and you're speaking to me from it, and it's the tree that I'm supposed to stay away from, but I'm right here next to it, talking to you while you're sitting in it. God has said that we cannot eat of this very tree. Right? Sin has not came into her mind yet. They hate this is was a place that where temptation can, temptation can happen. Therefore, because the serpent's on it, he's going to tempt me. That's not in her mind yet, right? But she's understanding and she's repeating what God said that they cannot eat of that tree. Now, here's where Adventist theology comes in. They say that this is the first lie that Eve told. Am I wrong or right? <laughs> you don't want to answer because you're waiting for the question I'm about to ask. Of course it's the first one. According to all in the Bible, because that's the only written uh, indication that we have of the conversation that uh, Moses wrote down. Okay, because if we go back to Genesis 2, 16 and 17, God never says anything about touching it. He only says about eating it, right? Here's my question. Could it be... Several things. Could it be that Eve said that we're not supposed to touch it as she was saying that as a warning to the serpent? You shouldn't be on it because you're God's best creature. Or could it be possibly in a conversation with her husband or in a conversation with one of the angels or in a conversation with God himself? It's not marked in Genesis 2's account. But yet, somewhere, God did tell them, don't touch it. Not as a way of saying, you'll die if you touch it, but don't touch it because that leads to you eventually what? Yeah. Eating it. Well, just, as, hold on, just as sin in our lives starts off small and gets bigger, 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 as we entertain more and more and more of it. I'm not saying that this is reality or true. I'm posing a question to make us think. Okay? Yes. How else are you going to eat it without touching it? you got to handle it. you got to go up to it. you got to do something, right? Well, so if you're not in that neighborhood, then you don't touch it or eat it. Well, both are true. In your mind. It depends on your definition of touch. <laughs> An apple hangs from the tree, I can reach up and... But somehow your body still, it still touches, touches it. it. But touch is a sense limited to your fingers. But you really, still but touch your body. <laughs> I'm just arguing with you debatably because I want you guys to think. Right? Definition means a lot of things. Perception in our world is reality, even if it's not reality. Does that confuse you? You see here, Eve, many believe, lie here. To be frank with you, I don't know whether this is the first lie or not. Because when I read my Bible, I notice that there's structures in the Bible, especially here in Genesis, it happens in Revelation, and other forms of the Bible. Perhaps you may be able to 
Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's known as a chiastic structure to where it happens in levels and then it goes down, plays in levels. You find that in the book of Daniel as well. Here in Genesis, it's no different. And it's the argument amongst non-believers is why is it that in Genesis 1, or in the first part of Genesis, is that it says God created mankind, but yet we didn't find that God created woman until later. Does that mean that they both weren't created on the sixth day, but yet woman was created on a different day? You all would say no. But that's not what non-Christians and atheists believe. Because it puts them at a separate creation. Yes, we know that, that God made Eve out of Adam. That is a separate creation. But they see it as a separate point in time. Because the Bible, what it does, it does an overview. And then the next chapter, it gives a detail. And the next chapter, it gives a detail. And then it goes a different sorts. It gives other types of details. That's how the Bible works. So this is what happens when people expect to read things chronological in the Bible. It doesn't always work. Because here I'll give you an example. Later on we read when Adam, when Eve is eating, it says, and she ate while her husband was right there by her side. I forget the exact wording. People believe that Adam was there while Lucifer was tempting Eve. No. That's not possible. It's just how the Bible is written. And some people do not understand that aspect, and they get confused with how things work. Is it possible that God or one of the angels did tell them not to touch it? It is absolutely 100% possible. Did it happen? I don't know. But why would she bring it up? Many would argue and say, well, when you enter in dialogue with the devil, it actually makes you bring up lies. But guess what? That is true. But that is true after the fall. Not prior to the fall. According to my understanding in, in the biblical text. Brother Ray, one of the things I want to sort of go back to, having this discussion among ourselves is good. And sometimes non-Christians as well ask these questions. But I still want to stick to the fact is that there's no excuse to be lost. And I know you're not saying that. No, no, no. God has enough for us to know where the information that he has supplied in the Bible would not excuse us or have no reason to be lost. There is enough for a man to be saved or for man to be saved. And so these things that we are discussing, uh, as good as it is, at the same time, Choice. we may not have all the facts or the answers. Even in reading some things, it's just not for us to understand. But the point I want to make is that there is enough in the Bible for anyone who's willing to be saved, he or she can be. Yeah, and the reason why I'm breaking this down like I am and not just saying the same old stuff that we would always say about the story is because I want you to have more facts. I want you to have more understanding than the basic story. I mean, how many of you would just tell people that, that Eve ate the fruit because she was deceived by Satan? And what if someone asked you, well, how? I don't know. It's just he talked to her, told her things she wanted to hear, and then she ate. Come on, that's boring. Well, it's simple. It, it is simple. And, and, and if you understand how I study the Bible, guess what? I read the simple first. I read the main story to understand the concept of what's happening. And then what happens? I go back again. And then I go back again. And I go back again. Because you cannot understand the, the, the depthness of it without understanding the basic. Right? You know what you're, what you're talking about? It's fascinating because I'm going to be bringing this out in the message here today. But there's something that is a literary style. that is not used just in scripture, but in other places it's called a gap. Okay. Yeah, there are gaps in scripture. And, and what it is are these, these, these gaps that where something is not explicitly given, but our minds want to fill in the blanks, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what we do. And this is a, this is a tactic that many authors use and, and so on. But um, honestly, I do believe that with the way that the Bible is written, the way that scripture is presented to us, it's designed for a dialogue. Mm -hmm. It's designed in such a way that we are having a communion, a dialogue with God, 
and we should be asking questions and we should be filling blanks as best we can based on what scripture does present to us but absolutely this is something that is you're going to find a lot in scripture is something called a gap and i find it interesting why people think that job said when he talked to god and was questioning him mm-hmm. because he wasn't questioning who he was or why he's doing things but he wanted answers to that's right to, that's to right. help him right understand Oh, great, great. I love that. Let's go on. Because <laughs> forget it. I don't even know if we're going to finish it. Okay, so where do we leave off? Verse 3, right? She talked about touching the two rules of the tree. You shouldn't eat it or you shouldn't touch it. Verse 4. And the serpent, by the way, have you thought about which one, if there is a lusting here? In verse 2, 3. Lusting out of beauty. Okay. Okay. I've seen it doing this. Okay. That's the way I understand it. Okay, maybe we'll be able to come back to it, hopefully. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, so now he's responding back to her, Ye shall not surely die, which we all know this is the first lie of the serpent, right? Here on this world. You've got to take that in context. It's not the first lie he told. It's the first lie here in this world, okay? This new created world. Ye shall not surely die. So he's... Telling her that what God initially told her about eating the tree is what? A lie. It's a lie. It's not true. Don't worry about it. You can eat of it. You won't die. For God, now he goes on to transition about the character of God. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. What is Satan here through the disguise of a serpent offering to Eve? Knowledge. Knowledge? Knowledge. What else? Equality with God. (coughs) Okay, hold on. I heard too many things. To be God. To be God. What else? Equality with God. Equality with God. What else? What else? Knowledge of good and evil. He's offering something to her. She don't have. That in regards to God's eyes, she'll never have. But he's saying, the reason why you can't have it is because God is holding you back from your true potential. You can be so much more, and you can know so much more, this is why God is holding you back. In a sense, he's saying, you don't have complete free will. Your free will only goes up to a certain level that God allows you to have. You guys get that? Because by God limiting her from eating the tree, says that she can only go up to a certain level. But the serpent says, if you eat from the tree, which is at that level, you can continue going up. There is no limit to your knowledge. There is no limit to your ability. The only limit is who? God. God. This is what the serpent is telling her. And he expresses to her in verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and she did eat. We'll stop right there. Now, if we go back to verse 2, we find something in, in, uh, interesting. I talked about the three ways to sin, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Here in verse 2, we find the lust of the eyes. Let's look at it. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may what? We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. What was Satan's question to her? Did not God say you cannot eat? So he's giving her what? A visual picture of the things that she can have, which includes the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But she said, no, we can't. So that's taken away. And then we have the lust of the flesh, because she's talking about we cannot eat of it, meaning she cannot partake in the enjoyment of that tree like she could any other tree, because then she knows that God has said she'll die. Verse 5 is the pride of life because what Satan is showing her 
is that if she eats of the tree, now she will extend her knowledge. She will extend who she is and now become like God. Knowing something that she didn't know. She knew good, but she didn't know evil. <clears throat> even, even, oh, even though she didn't know what evil was, there's something else out there that she cannot grasp, but if she eats of this fruit, now she can understand and be like her creator. Yes? It's interesting that um, she was content where she was at. I mean, her life was fulfilled and everything. And then the trickery of Satan says, but there's more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's more excitement. There's more fun. There's more, you know, visual things to take in. It, it's, you know, it, it's helping me see more of the kindness of Satan. And it's always about the enticements of pleasures and senses, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Not about what's doing right. Like how, many, how many of you know someone who was tempted with better pay in a position at work if they'll break the Sabbath, yeah. right? And they do it. And they say, well, I'm only going to do it until I can get ahead or I come to a point and then I'll stop because I'm financially stable and I'll continue keeping the Sabbath and I'll devote myself to all that other stuff. How I many of you have ever heard anybody say that? I have plenty of times, right? And then what eventually happens? They, they never come back to church, they want more. right? Love of the or world. they want more. There's all, it's always more and more and more. There's, there's always more, right? You're never content when it comes to that stuff. So when you see a poster on the side of the road, you only see the pretty people drinking, but you never see the drunk people. <laughs> right, you, you see the commercials of everyone happy, drinking and drinking and partying and a great lifestyle, but you don't see the after effects, right? Hungover with your clamato and <laughs> trying to get over your hangover or the bad stuff. You know, you hit someone, kill them while you're driving home. You don't see any of that stuff, right? Yes, dear. It's still the same thing. Uh, there's a lot of people that want to be like God today. And that's the same lie that's being told. Mm -hmm. well, if you think harder or, or God's within you, or, there's a lot of those false gods and teachings going mm -hmm. on still today. It's the same lies that are being taught. Yeah, even in Eastern meditation, yeah. you know, if, if you conduct yourself enough to empty your mind and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, sacrifice yourself to not have this much, well, then you will attain that enlightenment, right? So yeah, it's everywhere, even in Christianity. Now let's look, as we, verse 2 and 3 and 5 talk about the lust of the flesh, pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. But also in verse 6, I want to concentrate on this verse for the last five minutes. I knew we weren't going to get too much more than this. Now, in verse 5, for context's sake, let's read it again. For God thou know that in the day thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he gives this understanding to Eve that this is what she's missing. Verse 6 says something miraculous that I think everybody misses it. Okay? It starts off by saying, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Now for those of you who have read Spirit of Prophecy, you cannot answer my questions through this chapter. Unless I say it's okay. right? Because I want you guys to think. Those of you who haven't read it, because I know those of you who are ready, you're going to come up with the right answer right away. But I want you guys to think, for those of you who maybe have forgotten or have not read it. Just based off scripture, look at the wording. It says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Poor jobs. Think. She's here. She's looking at this tree. Okay, we don't have a tree. We did have a tree. She's looking at the tree. She said the tree's right here. She's looking at the tree. Speaking to the serpent. Serpent speaking back to her tongue, all the things that she's missing. And then the woman's listening to the very things in which she can gain from eating this fruit. And the Bible says all of a sudden the woman saw that the tree was good for food. What does that indicate in the form of an action? Her eyes are open. What else? For those of you, for those of you who have read Spirit of Prophecy, Alex, Han, you are not allowed to answer. I know you know all this stuff. Okay, yes, Alex is correct. The, the Bible is indicating exactly what he said. It says the woman saw that it was good for food. 
What's the next level of presentation that the serpent has to do to deceive Eve? He's already telling her that God is wrong, but words only go so far. What, happen, what has to happen next? A demonstration. Yeah, because my Bible says, and Satan and the serpent ate, as Eve watched the serpent eat the delicious fruit. What Bible do you have? I have the uh, clear word. Really? That's uh -huh. a paraphrase. Well, it's a paraphrase. It's not a Bible book. So it wouldn't say that, I guess. Right. But that's interesting that it does say that. I've never heard that. That's interesting. Um, but yeah, the clear word was made by an Adventist, so... I mean. Yeah, because she said, and then, <laughs> and then she suddenly got the strong urge to taste it. Okay. Because, like, like he was like, like when, <laughs> for me being a vegetarian, when somebody is eating like a real juicy, juicy. hamburger, and you're all salivating, and it's like, ooh, it looks so good. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I think, I think that's what happened. Is Satan with his with his sly smile was eating the apple and look right. at me. Nothing's happening to me. You know, nothing's happening. Let's go with that because that's a good illustration, right? So here. It says the woman saw that it was good for food. That would indicate that something happened to where someone ate, ate it because she saw that it was good for food. How else would she know that it was good to ingest unless the Bible says, as it does say, she saw that it was good to ingest, right? She saw that it was good for food. So who are the only two people here on the tree, near the tree? Satan and Eve. Eve's the one looking. Who's eating? Satan. The serpent's eating the fruit. It didn't kill it. Right? <laughs> We're not there yet. It says in verse 6, And the woman saw that the tree was good for food. So automatically, what God told Eve is now proven to be a lie by Satan. Because Satan, the serpent, is eating the fruit. And guess what? He didn't die. Right? So what does that trigger in Eve's mind? It's good. Well, if I eat it, then I'm not going to die. Right? Let's continue. Not only did she see that it was good for food, but that it was pleasant to what? Yeah. To the eyes. She already experienced the lust of the flesh by acknowledging that the fruit looked good to eat and that you can eat it. Then she experiences the lust of the eyes because now she's seen that it was pleasant to the eyes. She's seen that tree no longer is good and evil that God said not to eat. She's seen it as every other tree in the garden. Yes? Okay, what's inferred when Satan says, your eyes will be open? What is that telling me? You're blind. And is she going to say, I'm not blind? <laughs> right? I mean, is it, that's kind of the premise. Yes. Said. Yes. Pride, pride of pride. It's all three, actually, yeah. but you can break it up yeah. individually. You're blind, and I can, I can just hear. Yes. That's a good aspect of the story. Thank you for bringing that up. That's perfect. And not only does it say that she saw it was good for food, but pleasant to the eyes, but a tree to be desired to do what? Make one wise. Here is the answer to everything that's being told to her is this last thing, pride of life. God told her you can't eat of the fruit, yet the serpent's eating. She said you can't touch it, the serpent's touching it, right? She's seen that it's good for food, but now she's seen that it's good to be desired to make one wise. Up to this point, when she met the serpent in the tree, no animals spoke. This is the first animal that ever spake in the garden. Now she gets her answer on why the serpent is telling her that God is holding her back and that she can be much more. What's the answer? Because the fruit gave the serpent the ability to think and to speak. And because that fruit gave the serpent that ability, now it could give her a better ability than what she has. By using the very words and actions that the serpent <laughs> used, he tricked and deceived Eve into thinking the fruit was good for her benefit. Because it did not hurt him, 
and it will help her. This was the pride of life. And then, while well, you can say, says the eyes of them were both open, or excuse me, let me go back, says she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. Now it says she took of the fruits. When you read that in context with the original language, it's not saying that she went and plucked the fruit. It says it was given to her. So as the serpent eats, as the serpent shows her that all the things God said are lies, because none of it happened to him, and now he's the only creature that can speak because of the fruit, he gets the fruit, drops it in her hand, and what happens? She realizes again, she didn't die. She didn't die. Why? Touched she it. touched it. And if she's going to live and not die because she touches it, puts it in her mouth and eats it. Then we have the beginning stages of the sin problem where she eats and realizes how powerful she is as this overcoming feeling came over her that she never witnessed before. <coughs> And she went and gave to her husband, and he did eat. Now, he made a choice to go against God and eat of the fruits. Not because he believed the deceptions of the serpent, because he wasn't there. He chose to eat the fruit out of his love for his wife, because he could not think of living in eternity without her. It's the same example that Christ took on the cross. Right. Where he took the penalty in order to die for us as sinners so that we can live in eternity with him. Yes. Can I read what it says in mine? Quickly. It says that she picked it, took a bite, and instantly felt a surge of energy. Excited, she took more fruit and ran to find her husband. When Adam saw her, he sensed what she had done. But in the blush of her excitement, she looked more beautiful than ever. He couldn't bear the thought of living without her, so he took the fruit and ate it. Okay. From Clearwood, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I'm surprised at that. I don't have much good things to say about Clearwood, but I like that. Okay. So the reason why I went through it the way I did as we closed is because we've all heard this story over and over and over again. I just didn't want to repeat the same thing over and over again. This is Sabbath school. It's time to discuss. It's time to learn from each other. And I want to help you guys understand the Bible more in depth than just our usual understanding in the Scripture. Because to be honest, a lot of times, and I've heard other people say this, when we go through the same stories over and over again in Scripture, people tend to not want to hear or be part of the discussion because it's the same old, same old all the time. I don't want to be that same old, same old teacher. I want to show you something different that's there in Scripture, not different because I want to make it different. Right? I want to teach you from the Bible and help you to see from the Bible about what it's truly saying in the depthness of Scripture. So I hope, and we're going to have to close with that, I hope that uh, you all learned something, and I hope that we can have greater discussions in the future. Let's close with a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I just thank you for this time that you've given us. And I pray that it would be a blessing to each and every one of us, and not only for those of us in here, but those that are on Zoom and Facebook. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that our Sabbath is a true blessing, and as we move on to our next service, that it will be a true great blessing as well. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm going to say it anyway. I really enjoyed this lesson because I, it just overall showed me all the different sins that were involved in this. i never seen that before, and uh, you brought it out, and it was amazing to me. So I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I'm glad you saw it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> to the left, to the left. <laughs> Two steps. Thank you, Ray, for that lesson this morning. And thank you for everybody showing up to the lesson this morning. Well, we're going to open up to page 483 if we can get the tennis up here. I need to be every hour. We've been sitting for a while. Show me all stand up. Thank <laughs> you.